He says you want to be, he trades, and this is what he says, between the 20 and 80 yard line. So once the ball goes past 20, you've got momentum. And you want to sell at the 80 yard line. And Warren Buffett said the same thing. He says he always leaves the last 15% of any move to whoever else is out there. He said, that's when it gets a frenzy, it gets too frothy, and yeah, you might have missed out on 15%, but you're taking money from the middle. You're waiting for a trend to be established, and then you get in. These other guys, they're the market movers. They're trying to create the trend. They're trying to show everyone else that they're right. As a technical trader, most of the time, you're waiting. This is Bitcoin Basics Podcast with your host, Ferris. That's me and Gordon from Coin Compass. We're Bitcoin advisors and educators supporting business and individual investors to safely buy, manage, and control their private keys, Bitcoins. This podcast is strictly educational and is not intended to be financial or investment advice. Full disclaimer in the show notes and at the end of this episode. Okay, so one of the other things that we hear a lot about, especially for new retail traders like myself, even though I don't do it anymore, is technical analysis versus fundamental analysis. So fundamental analysis and technical analysis are, you're basically doing the same thing in trading, but your reason for getting into the trade is very different. I am a technical trader. Um, Before I explain what that is, let me explain fundamental trading first. So fundamental trading is you believe the price of an underlying asset is wrong and should change. Um, I'll give you a good example. Um, One that springs to mind is I'm mentioning there's an article in Forbes about a guy running a hedge fund called Mark Hart. Now, Mark Hart has been on Real Vision and he was an early proponent who was very pro-Bitcoin. So very clever guy. Young guy, very clever, and ran a huge fund. Now, I'm going to get some of these dates and numbers wrong, but the theme is right. So he was under the impression that the Chinese currency, the renminbi, was overvalued against the US dollar and was going to come down. And his fund put a lot of money into it, believing that the central bank of China was going to devalue the Chinese renminbi. The problem that he had was the Chinese um, central bank rate at the time was around 8%. The US dollar central bank rate was about 3%, which means you're buying, sorry, you're selling Chinese renminbi, so you're paying the other side an 8% yield. You're paying that 8% yield, but you're earning 3%. So you're about 5%. So as long as you hold that trade, the cost of carry for that trade was 5%. For someone trading a few thousand dollars, that's not much. For a fund where I think he traded $200 million, that's a lot of money. And anyone seen the story of the big short? That's where a lot of those those guys got screwed. They were early, but they, they ended up going broke, even though they eventually were right, because they ran out of money to pay for the position. So Mark Hart proved to be right. The Chinese did devalue, but he was 18 months early. And in those 18 months, he had to pay out that money. Now, again, I'm not picking on him. He's a very clever man. He understands Bitcoin very well. He was right, but he was too early. So the fundamentals are basically saying, I know something needs to change based on XYZ. So, for example, if you look at Apple now, people believe Apple as a, as a stock, um, as a company is overvalued. Why? They are no longer the leader in any market. So they're not the leader in phones. They're not the leader in cloud. They're not the leader in, in um, laptops, desktops, or tablets. They're not the leader in any segment of their market. Why in the world is their stock so high? So people believe it's due for correction. Now, same thing with Tesla. People were shorting Tesla at two hundred dollars. It's at six hundred dollars. So that's at nine hundred dollars, is isn't it? Nine twenty. Yeah, this is where I'm going to sound like a complete and utter dick, and I'll admit to it now. So the reason I bring up that thing with China is I made a very small profit in that trade. Why? Because I waited. 
my technical single said, get in now. And I did. So even though Mark Hart and his fund and several others were early, they knew what was going to happen long before I did. Why? Because they're a hell of a lot smarter than I am. My technical signals, so my chart said, no, it's going up, it's going up, it's going up. Then it starts to go down. So good way to think of it is this way. If you play American football, your team wants to go from the zero yard to the 100-yard line, which is a touchdown line. So they've got 100 yards to cover. The really smart guys, they want to get in on those first five yards. That's when they want to get in. And they want to sell as close to that 100-yard line. A technical trader, and if you want to find out about technical trading, one name to look at is Peter Brandt, B-R-A-N-D-T. He's very active on Twitter. Look him up. Um, I'll talk more about him later. He says you want to be, he trades, and this is what he says, between the 20 and 80 yard line. So once the ball goes past 20, you've got momentum. And you want to sell at the 80 yard line. And Warren Buffett said the same thing. He says he always leaves the last 15% of any move to whoever else is out there. He said that's when it gets a frenzy, it gets too frothy, and yeah, you might have missed out on 15%, but you're taking money from the middle. You're waiting for a trend to be established, and then you get in. These other guys, they're the market movers. They're trying to create the trend. They're trying to show everyone else that they're right. As a technical trader, most of the time, you're waiting. You're waiting That's funny. for the it's funny you mentioned the 80-20 because whenever I think about that, I think about the RSI between the 20 and 80% bands. And sometimes technical analysis kind of goes out the window when you're looking at Bitcoin and especially altcoins. Um, even with Bitcoin, like when it's on a massive run up, you know, Bitcoin's like 80%, 90% in the RSI, completely overbought. And you're like, yeah, we're due for a correction. It's definitely going to go down now and just keeps on going up and up and up for like another six months, 92%, 95% overbought. Um, so yeah, but it's a really good point with the, uh, going into the FOMO and that's probably why Bitcoin's a lot more volatile, I assume, than more traditional markets. Cause you've got retail, uh, traders like myself who FOMO in, we FOMO in and we buy it and we, you know, ride it as long as we can. And we panic sell when, when you see a little bit of red. Um, so that's, do, do you think that's one of the reasons why Bitcoin is volatile? That doesn't, we're, we're minnows. We don't even move the market at all. So the reason Bitcoin is volatile is simply because, um, like what we were talking about before, um, there wasn't that much liquidity in it. Like when you compare how much money goes into Bitcoin, it's minuscule. To this day, you compare it to how much is traded in gold, it is minuscule. There's such little money going in it, it didn't take anyone with that much money to influence a price. So the market mover in cryptocurrency is one ten thousands probably of the market mover in any other um conventional market that's why you've got institutional houses that buy and trade in conventional markets you don't have that in bitcoin but we're starting to get that but one thing i just want to mention with technical trading is an analogy i really like is if you're a surfer so let's say i like to surf most surfers will be up before the crack of dawn, they want to be the first ones on the beach to catch the first wave. Let's just say I set up a webcam at my favorite beach. And I'll wake up and I'll just have a little webcam. I'll go, oh, surf doesn't look that good. I'm going to wait. I'll look at my webcam an hour later and there's maybe a half a dozen surfers out there. Now, they're the first ones there. They've got bragging rights. First ones there. But they're probably just sitting there. There's no waves. Then when I see maybe, you know, those waves start to come in, then I'll go and join in. What have I done? I'm not the first one there, but I've waited till the waves come. And sure, I never had the beach to myself, but they did. But all they did was sit there and wait. And then at the end of the day, the sun's starting to go down. I'm going, you know what? I've had a good surf. I'm going to leave. These other guys will go, no, I might get one more good ride. and might wait another hour to get one more wave. That's the analogy with swing trading and with technical trading. You're not the first in, you're not the last out. You don't have any bragging rights, but you make money. Any profit is good profit. Yeah. Yes, that, that's sound advice. Okay, so let's get back to perhaps our last question, which really is what perhaps some people want to ask, and that's, well, 
maybe I want to buy Bitcoin or I've already bought Bitcoin, but I want to dabble in some trading. What do you have in terms of best practices? How do people get started? What, what do you suggest? Education, just learn. Read. There's so many books out there. The number one book you start with is Market Wizards. And the reason you start with Market Wizards is because Jack Schwager, who interviewed them, he, he basically interviewed the best traders that ever lived. And so you want to figure out what do you enjoy? And this is something we tell our kids, you know, when you go to college, do what you enjoy. With trading, I like technical trading because I love looking at charts. I love that cognitive process. Some people can't do it. You can't, they can't look at charts. Other people, and I'll mention Eric Townsend, who runs Macro Voices Podcast. Now, he has his niche, and his niche is the futures market in Brent and, Brent and crude oil. That's his niche. He likes to look at what is happening in the world, and he, only, he will only trade oil. But he has done so much research before he puts on a position. Whereas me, I, as a technical trader, I mean, I was putting on anywhere from 40 to 50 trades a week. And I couldn't tell you what company in equities. I could not, I could tell you, I can't even tell you who it was. I would look at the ticker and the, and I wouldn't tell you who it was. You'd ask me, who, you know, what trades you have on? I'd say, oh, I don't know. i tell you the <laughs> ticker. I don't even know what the company does. Sometimes I did, but to me, what's the chart telling me? And I'll go in and out, in and out. So Market Wizards is good because he's talking, he's interviewing these traders, and you can figure out, well, what will I enjoy doing? And, um, yeah, I the reason I suggested Peter Brandt before was because um, he lives by the code of strong opinions loosely held, which basically means if a trade goes against you, just get out. Huh. Don't hope it's going to turn and feed it. I, and I've done that. I've lost so much money thinking I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. Eventually, everyone else will realize that I'm right, but I've lost so much money in the process. Whereas if I had my stop loss in place, I'm just out and I'm even going to another trade. Yeah, this is, this is one of the things, and it's the same with Bitcoin wallets. We're kind of explaining what a Bitcoin wallet is and whatever, and you can do as much there as you want. But until you actually do it, you don't, you know, kinesthetically, hands-on, you don't kind of understand what a Bitcoin wallet is. I think it's the same in trading. Like you can, you can do as much technical analysis, you can watch as much YouTube videos and read books and courses, whatever. But until you actually start trading, because I know myself, you know, when I was looking up this stuff for the first time, I was watching YouTube videos like they're going out of fashion. I'm like, yep, I've got my stop loss. I'm looking at this, looking at RSI, I'm looking at blah, 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 all these indicators. But then when you start trading with your own money, all of that, all your trading plan goes out the window and you're like, no, I'm going to find my way in. Even though my indicators are telling me it's not good. I just have a good feeling about this trade. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So with that, A, best thing you can do is now I'll give you an indication. So I did a course to learn how to trade and it cost several thousand dollars, actually. Um, the trading plan, and this was specifically for equities. So equities means stocks. The guy who did this course, he was honestly the best educator I have ever come across. And I've worked in several universities and I'm, you know, we're educators ourselves. He, he's by far the best educator I've ever come across. Our trading plan, so basically how to get in and out of a trade was over 100 pages long. Wow. So he wrote a book for every scenario, every candle, how you get in and out, looking at volume. And I traded really well because I followed the plan. So you put all that stuff down in a spreadsheet and you would have a, che a checklist. Check, check, check. Doesn't meet that, move on. Check, 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 check. Doesn't meet that, move on. So it was just regimented. It was automated. It was simple. It was hard work, but it was simple. When did I lose money? When I stop following my plan. Yeah. So I, that's what it is. And the thing is, the reason why there aren't that many technical traders out there and it's actually frowned upon is because you don't need to go to an Ivy League school to learn how to become a technical trader. The guys that we're talking about who run hedge funds, they would have gone to Harvard Business School. They would have gone to MIT, Brown. They would have gone to all these lucrative schools to basically get where they are. A technical trader, anyone can download a book and learn how to do it. 
It's not respected, but it works mm. when you do it right. Yeah, exactly. Do it right is the main point. I find it funny how when I first started learning about trading, I had all these indicators. I had a chart with all this stuff happening, colors and lines going everywhere, indicators and whatnot. And now it's kind of like, actually, I think I maybe only have one indicator and that's the RSI, maybe a MACD. But I kind of look at a basic chart and I kind of have gotten, I've sort of simplified it and gotten rid of all the noise. And it's like, yep, I'm looking at a chart. It's got candles, it's got volume, it's got price. Yeah, so I actually, I've gone to trading naked charts at the moment and I'm finding that's a lot better. Mm. I mean, I'm not, Sounds to be honest, I'm single trading. But just to answer your question, which I didn't do yet, is if you want to get into trading, here's what you do. Educate mm. yourself, start with market wizards. Um, we might even put up a list of recommended books, Gordon. Um, yeah, I think we will. If you want to get into it, uh, you, first of all, if you're planning on getting into full-time trading, have two years worth of income in the bank. So that's not your trading capital. Two years worth of income where you don't have to worry about bills being paid. If your trading fails, at least you know you're going to pay your bills. So two years worth of income in there. Um, the first year will define you, is what they say in trading. So if you don't make it in the first year, get out, find something else to do. And regimented risk control. Every trade is the same amount. So with that, what I mean by that, say, okay, I look at buying shares in Apple, and then I'm looking at buying shares in Samsung. Well, and then I'm looking at buying Huawei. Well, first of all, you're buying the same industry. What happens if the prices of semiconductors go down, something like that? All three of them are affected, so you're not diversified. But also, you want to say, if I go, okay, I, I like Apple more than I like Huawei, so I'm going to put more in Apple and Huawei. You've broken your rule. It's the same amount per trade. You need to remain an objective. This is why I don't actually look at a company at the name. I just, because when I set up my charts, I remove the title in, in Metastock. I just look at the, the chart and then the ticker. Because so many of them won't even recognize. Because as soon as I recognize it, that bias kicks in. Yeah, good advice. Good advice. And so, sorry, one more. This is yeah, something yeah. I've started doing recently, which works really well for Bitcoin, because we have we have a we have a bias. You do. So with Bitcoin lately, I've been looking at the charts. I'm going, is it in an uptrend? Should I get in? And I'm not sure. What do I do? I flip the chart. Flipping the chart basically just turns it upside down. That will completely remove your bias. You go, oh, that's heading higher, which means it's heading lower. Right. Yeah, that's a good trick. Um, so let's leave the day trading and people who want to be a full-time trader behind. Let's concentrate on the person who has a full-time job. They want to do a little bit of trading on the weekend or they want to do, you know, a couple of trades a year or whatnot. What, how, do, how should they go about it? So, A, first of all, you know, we say don't, but if you're going to, you got to yeah. figure out what's my time horizon. So time horizon means when are you going to sit down and look at a chart? If you were to sit down and look at a chart every single day at a specified time, then you can do swing trading, which is you trade every day. So you buy today, you check tomorrow at the same time. If you're only doing it on weekends, then you are only looking at a weekend chart. There's no point looking at the daily chart of Bitcoin if your trading entry and exit is based on weekend. So you only look at weekend charts. So basically figure out what is your time horizon, which means I sit down at this time every day, every week or every month religiously, and that's when I trade. If you can only do it every three or four days, move to a weekly chart. If you are going to do it full time every day, then yes, do swing trading. But the longer time horizons, the more lucrative they are. And that is in any asset class. Why? Because you're taking out that volatility in, in the week there. You think about, just go on to Bitcoin, look at an hourly chart, look at a four hourly chart, then look at a weekly and then a monthly chart. How much cleaner and more obvious does a trend get on those longer time horizons? We don't think that way. I mean, Bill Gates said people overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in a decade. Mm. Same thing with trading. The, the wider your time horizon, the better you'll do. But we're not designed that way and the trading systems are not designed that way. You get real-time alerts. You get minute charts. They want you in and out, in and out, in and out, because that's how they make their money on the commissions from your buying and selling. 
Yeah, I've pretty much given up looking at four hour charts now. I just look at weekly charts and monthly charts. And I've recently discovered a lot of people trade on the quarterly or three monthly chart, which I find yep. pretty interesting. Okay, um, one last thing is I've noticed in some of these exchanges and trading platforms, there's now a feature called Copy Trader. And I've heard that on um, eToro and a couple other places as well. And by the way, they're not a sponsor. Um, basically, what happens is you sign up for an account and you can see a list of top traders. So on a site like eToro, another trading platform, you see a top 10 or top 20 or whatever it is. And you say, I want to follow this person's uh, trades. And what it will do is actually what it says it will do. It will copy their trades, you know, in real time and whatever. Do you think, what, what do you think about that? Hey, look, I wouldn't do it simply because I enjoy trading. I love looking at charts. I love the process of going through a chart and looking for patterns. I really enjoy that. So I wouldn't do it because to me, there's just no value in it. The one thing I'd be careful of, that that sounds like a huge liquidity trap to me. So like we were yeah. talking about before, some, you start following someone, he gets more popular, and then he's got followers he can then sell his product to. That's my concern there. I, I, I think that's a great scam, actually. You could get someone who basically everyone follows and then with a separate account, they're doing the exact opposite to what they're doing with their, you know, tiny little account that everyone else is following. Yeah, and this um, this does happen, and I'm, I'm going to reference Mark Yusko again here. And if you haven't picked it up by now, I've got a huge man crush on Mark Yusko. He's just a brilliant man who explains things very, very well. Um, Mark, if you're listening, we've been trying to get you on. Um, yeah, come on. And he said... He made this of where's, uh, I'm not going to say the guy's name, um, but this guy who can influence the bond market went out and said that bonds were going up. And he said that he could be saying that to the general public and they might have in their fund that they're long bonds. And this fund would be a fund that, you know, many people can get into. But then they've got a separate shadow fund, which is just for very, very wealthy clients. And that's going to go the other way. So he goes, how can you morally do that when you have, you're, you know, you're running a business that is doing two separate things, or the same thing in two directions. You're long one way, so some clients are guaranteed to lose money. So he just he says, I don't see how you can ethically do that, because you are selling this product to some people and um, from one person to another. And we saw this with the housing crisis; they deliberately made a product to lose money. That they're going to sell to their cheaper clients to benefit their wealthier clients. I think it was, I can't remember, it was one of the um, big private banks that did that. Mm. Fair enough. I will uh, leave you with your man crush. And on that note, I think we'll call it a day. <laughs> um, my advice would be to uh, not trade, just uh, buy and hold Bitcoin. And I've mentioned dollar cost averaging several times. It basically means, let's say every month you get your paycheck you um, buy a little bit of Bitcoin, you don't worry about the price, you don't sort of time it too much. And uh, over a you know a span of time, maybe a year or whatever, your losses and gains are going to be kind of averaged out. And considering the Bitcoin market is going up, uh, not perpetually, but um, with its swings, um, you're kind of getting into it. But I must say, I've really come around to the idea that the best way, and Andreas Antonopoulos says this, to get Bitcoin is actually to earn Bitcoin. And a lot of people are sort of, you know, putting their savings in, putting this in and investing or whatever. Just start a, a, a small online business or your hobby or whatever, you know, sell whatever it is online for a couple of bucks, um, whether that's a second job, like a serious job, whether it's just a weekend sort of thing. Sell stuff for Bitcoin and so you're going to be able to accumulate it that way. But another even easier way is a lot of the newer sort of credit cards and companies and there's extensions for browsers enable you to get cash back so that when you spend on travel or insurance or whatever it is, you can actually get up to 5% cash back, the rewards you normally would have got uh, in Bitcoin. So you can basically accumulate Bitcoin that way. That's what I do every single time I book a hotel or travel. So that's definitely a great way to get a little bit of Bitcoin. Yeah, very exciting. And um, yeah, and this is something we've just started to do as well, is open up ourselves to this uh, the business point of this business to this world. And um, uh, Gordon, I'll let you mention how we're doing it. We're 
Are we partnering with people, recommending people? What are we doing? Yeah, we're not necessarily endorsing or recommending, although we have used these services ourselves. But for example, in the description of this video, if you're watching on YouTube or the show notes in the podcast, if you wanted to do some trading, one of the uh, best trading platforms that we both use is called TradingView. So you can click on that link, coincompass.com slash TradingView, and you know you sign up for that and that gives us, what, 10 bucks or 15 bucks. Not a heck of a lot, but you know it keeps the lights on, uh, give us a few beers or a few coffees. Um, so yeah, that's called affiliate or referral links. Um, yeah, a bit of extra money our way. Not going to be able to, to quit our day jobs, but uh, every little bit helps. And with that, I use TradingView. It's funny, I've actually got it open right now in case you're watching. Uh, I've used several providers and trading. Yeah, trading is really good. They've actually got more on their platform than a lot of others. Um, yeah, and we're, yeah, we're not going to plug anything. We're not gonna hmm. So yeah, uh, we've mentioned a heck of a lot on this podcast. So we will leave all links to resources, including perhaps you could come up with a list of books and um, things that people could check out if they want to get into trading. And uh, yeah, if you wanted to sign up for a TradingView account or you wanted to buy some Bitcoin on an exchange, please use our links in the description. That just helps us out a little. Excellent. Thank you for listening, everyone. And uh, yeah, do as Gordon said, please. Yeah. Thank you, Ferris. Extremely educational and um, quite useful. But um, yeah, just don't, uh, don't trade. Bye. Oh, no. I'm going to go back on what I said then. Don't trade, don't buy, earn Bitcoin. I think you should buy Bitcoin. Yeah, well, maybe both. Maybe both. All right, thank you, everyone. Until next time, everyone. Thanks for watching or listening. Please visit coincompass.com slash free to register to our socials and discover other free content. Subscribing, liking, and following helps this content remain ad-free. Until next time.